as we get ready to spend several weeks with Joy Kagawa's novel, Obasan, I'd like to bring your attention back to a comment I made very early on in this course. As we were beginning our time together, one of the things I said was that this is not a history course. And I kind of, in an offhanded way, said I wasn't particularly interested in history. Now, I am interested in history, but what I want to have us start thinking about is different versions of history and how it's important to understand different versions of history. Because if we come to a historical document, and there are many in Obasan, and we simply take the facts it presents as being absolute, we really lose all of the critical capacity that we've been developing and exercising in our various writing courses and literature courses over the past several years. So when you encounter a historical document, and we'll be encountering again many of them uh, in this text or references to them, we need to come to it with a um, skepticism, I think, is an appropriate word, even though it's perhaps a little extreme. Um, we need to have a skepticism about them, not just simply versions of history that we disagree with, but also versions of history that we agree with as well. And I think Obasan is a fascinating novel because it invites that kind of inquiry on a number of levels, which you're probably um, uh, becoming aware of now uh, that you're familiar with at least the first half of the novel. One of the ways to approach this text would be for me uh, or for one of you to give a, a sustained you know, lecture on um, the history of, of the, uh, the Japanese internment camps which would be totally appropriate. Um, but I think um, from my point of view, um, what I will be doing is leading you into a consideration of history as is represented in the novel um, without turning to very many external sources. I have a literary agenda here as well, um, but the idea is to see how this, n how this narrator, how this author uh, represents the conditions and the life that, that her various characters um, you know, went through, lived through, things like that. So. If you're wondering why I'm not providing an extensive background on this issue, um, it's, it's primarily for that reason. I want history to come to us through the novel. I want that to be the primary vehicle for us to consider. And, I, I, and I'll be explaining why as we get further through the course. With all of that aside, one of the things I would turn your attention to specifically is this fascinating, you know, the fascinating kind of contrasts that emerge um, in the first uh, half of the novel, as well as some very sharp themes uh, and motifs you may be picking up on. In terms of contrasts, I would turn your attention um, to the uh, the photograph, uh, the family photograph that we encounter very early on, and how everyone is described, you know, with a great deal of specificity in that photo. Uh, we supposedly learn a great deal about their character, and we get a lot of their background history as well. If we contrast that with the dreams about the family members. Uh, we find two very different ways of, of recognizing and of understanding and of, of dealing with history uh, in this novel. We have you know that, that just fantastic dream that comes early on in the novel shortly after we learn of Uncle's death uh, in which we see him with a rose in his teeth and a rose with an endless stem uh, which is just one of the slightly, I'll use the word surreal although it might not be totally appropriate, um, images that comes to us uh, in that dream. Um, and we might start to think about, well, you know, which version of the family is more accurate or more meaningful, uh, the dream version or the photograph version. We might also start picking up on certain themes. Um, you might have noticed that there are many, many references to bathrooms and chamber pots uh, in this novel. And the question is, you know, why, why are we continually returning to that space, to outhouses, things like that? Why, why, is, why are we so focused on that in this novel? Um, uh, what are some potential reasons for that? And I'm sure we'll discuss that as well. You may be noticing a number of birds um, in this novel, particularly a number of chickens, uh, chickens and, uh, and chicks, I guess, that show up um, at various points and in various ways. Um, and an overriding sense, an overriding sense or concern with time, uh, which brings us back to the issue of history in this text. The author is continually looking or thinking about or talking about time. If you look for the specific you know, number of references to time in this novel, you'll find that there are very many. In fact, if you do a Google search uh, through Google Books and you just look for the word time in this novel, you will find numerous references. Um, it's not that Joy Kagawa didn't know any other words. Uh, there's a reason why she's using this word again and again in so many contexts. And also we might compare that generally, or maybe not compare, but we might consider her use of that word many times uh, with her use of, of the word or the phrase, I guess I should say, you know, Canadian. Uh, there are numerous instances in this text where characters say, we are Canadian. Um, it's always said in a state of confusion. And we might wonder why that's the case. So there's, you know, going into this novel, 
much more than two weeks worth of information to talk about and I'm just kind of skimming across some of the, the general points of entry or access that we might engage this evening and certainly you'll have your own and we'll discuss those through the presentations. Um, but anyway, it's a big book coming up. Uh, it's a really rich book and it's going to give you an opportunity to put all the tools we've been developing for the past six weeks to use. So really excited about it um, and I will see you in class. Bye.